one of the common characteristics of systems thinking, and I know it's not universal, but you see it in virtually everything from Peter Senge onwards, is the temptation to get a group of executives together and agree how the world would be a better place if only we achieved X objective. It's kind of like the standard form. Let's all agree where we want to go. Yeah, that tends towards idealism. It can tend towards platitudes, but it's aspirational. And then harsh reality catches up. And having lived through this in data sciences, IBM, hunting surveys and consultants, as an employee and then in multiple organizations as a consultant, it's also a universal pattern. Whenever people set aspirational future goals, they almost inevitably doom themselves to disappointment because they come up against harsh reality pretty fast. So one of the motivations on this, and this comes with this key concept in complexity theory, which is basically says we start journeys with a sense of direction. It's far more important to know where we are yeah, and where we can go next than to have an aspirational future goal. You know, we might use something like that literally as aspirational. You know, we all want to go to heaven, but we need something a lot more pragmatic as the next stage or purgatory, as we were talking about earlier. Um, so one of the key things in understanding that is energy. So in evolution, um, evolution tends to energy optimization. So one of the interesting things about energy is that and the, the, the phrase I've used a lot is if the energy cost of virtue is less than the energy cost of sin, people will be virtuous, but vice versa. It doesn't matter how much you admonish them, people go with the flow. And that phrase go with the flow is actually quite important. Yeah. So that started to get me very interested. And of course, from a physics background, everything is energy anyway. Yeah. And to, could we map the energy gradients of a system? Because if we can map the energy gradients, we're better able to understand what we can do, yeah, and what our optimal pathways forward are, and we're less likely to head our knock our heads against those brick walls of future goals. So that was kind of like one motivation. And then I came along constructor theory from Deutsch's work, yeah, and others um, at the Hay Festival. If you haven't been to How the Light Gets In, it's where a lot of my ideas come from. It's this wonderful four days every year where you have nothing but philosophers and scientists and politicians in multiple debates, you know, and on a intense near the River Wye in Wales. So it's a great experience. And I was interested enough in this. I wanted a whole half day course on it. And I'll talk more about the theory on that later. But constructor theory in physics was basically the first attempt to understand systems as a whole rather than trying to understand them through their different parts. And there's a key concept in constructor theory called a counterfactual. And a counterfactual is a divide between what can be and what can't be. It's important to understand it like that. Yeah. So understanding that boundary becomes critical. And that's got that's what got me thinking. At the same time, I've been working for a long time now with Alicia Girardo on constraints. And just to warn you, Alicia and I have a substantial disagreement now over constraints and constructors, which will be played out in Washington in a few weeks time. If anybody hasn't booked, that is going to be a fun event. Yeah. Um, but we were using the constraint based defini definition of complexity, talking about enabling constraints, governing constraints and so on. And that's still key within Kinevic. So constraints and constructors became very interesting. Right. So that was kind of like the way it came came about. And after about five, six, seven years, I can't remember exactly how long, I started to move it into practice. Yeah, drawing things on flip charts, having conversations, see what 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 bit and what didn't. And this one has bitten faster than anything I've ever developed in my life before. Um, so the basic chart on Estorine is a grid between energy cost of change and time to change. And that just seems to intuitively appeal to people. Yeah? And they all understand it. And to be honest, these days, we tend to position it as a pre-process. So don't challenge existing approaches to strategy. Say you're going to do that anyway, but map the energy gradients first. And then they'll realize they don't need to do the traditional approach, or at least in some cases, right, is, is a good way of dealing with this. And then S3 came up because people started to confuse constructor theory with constructional law from Bayesian. Now, I should say this is the physicist in me showing my prejudices, I've always preferred quantum mechanics over thermodynamics anyway. 
And my problem with Bayesian theory and constructional law is in Deleuzian terms, it was called arbitorial. So everything flows in one direction. It's kind of like tree branches, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see where that's very appealing to people in consultancy and they were picking up process philosophy at the same time. And this sort of constant theme that everything always goes in one direction, I find deeply problematic. And that was when I said, hell, it's not it's not a river, for Christ's sake. God, God guys, it's an estuary. Yeah, in the estuaries, the water flows out and it flows backwards. Yeah, if you've got a low powered boat, you can cross the estuary at the turn of the tide, but not when the tide is flowing. Yeah, the level of brackishness in the water indicates the degree of water flow. Yeah, the salt water, fresh water boundary is critical. There are granite cliffs that you might have to check every 10 or 15 years. There are sandbanks you have to check at every turn of the tide. So it's a really powerful metaphor for the reality of organizational life. We live in an estuarine environment. Things can go backwards, they can go forwards. Some things we need to pay attention to, but we never know what. And that really became the underlying metaphor for what then became estuarine mapping. So to be clear on this, the estuarine framework is the energy time grid. Estuarine mapping is the process which creates it along with other supporting processes.